Thank you, Lynn. And what a wonderful reading we have this morning. The church is not a hall of fame. You don't gain entrance because of your past achievements. The church is a hall of failures. People like me who have failed to keep the law of God. People who have failed God. People who have failed others. But, but, they know that they have been loved by the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them. And we have received his forgiveness. We have received the gift of eternal life. And by grace, we are able to keep on living a righteous life. That's why John addresses the church that he's writing to as dear friends. Really, it's not a very good translation. The true translation is beloved. Beloved. Loved by God. Loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Loved by the Holy Spirit. Loved by John the Apostle. Loved by one another. That's the church. And the church is a fellowship of loved ones. In the world, you might be neglected, rejected, or dejected. But in the church, you are a loved one. A son or daughter of the living God. A brother or sister of those around you. Down on the Bait Haven Oval near Birdland, there are two old water tanks that have been done over with a mural. And the mural is in memory of a young man who committed suicide here in Batemans Bay five years ago. And on the mural are the words, you are somebody's someone. Well, each of us here are God's someone. You are loved by him and special to him. Now what is love? The Greeks have four words for love. We've only got one in English. Greeks have the word storge, which means family love. They have the word eros, which means romantic, sexual love. They have the word philia, which means mateship. And they have the word agape, agape or agape, which means selfless and sacrificial love. And that's what this passage, all the references are to agape, selfless, sacrificial love. And love is so well defined in 1 Corinthians 13. In that wonderful chapter by Paul and where we can interchange the word love with Jesus. Paul says love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love is not boastful or arrogant. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. Love is not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's the kind of love that Paul speaks about and John speaks about. A young woman aged 22 who was working in a very high-powered job in the IT industry and earning a very good income felt empty in her soul. She looked around 
and saw despair in the world. She feared the future. So she decided to go to church. All her workmates and her friends thought she was crazy. And after a few weeks, she asked an older woman in the congregation to explain her what, what's going on in the church services. And the older lady asked the younger one, well, tell me first, what do you know about the Christian faith? And she said, hardly anything. Do you know about Easter? Oh, it's, it's a holiday and I, I, I don't know anything more about it. And what about Christmas? Oh, I, I think it celebrates a birthday, but I'm not sure. What about the Bible? Well, I, I've never seen one or even read one. And I, it was only when I came to church that I heard about it. And so the older lady gave a Bible, the younger one, and opened it at 1 Corinthians 13 and asked the one, younger one to read it. And she, she was reading it. And she started crying. Then as she neared the finish, she was sobbing. And after she'd finished, she was sobbing uncontrollably. When she had settled down, the older lady said to her, what touched you so much about that reading? And the younger one said, they are the most beautiful words I have ever read. And then she said, I've been searching for this all my life. And then she said to the older woman, please don't let the church let me down. Because as churches, we preach about love, we talk about love, but do we practice it? In 1 John 3 verse 18, John says, little children, let love not be in word or speech only, but in action and in truth. In verse 4, we have John addressing the church as dear children. John was probably about 85 or 90 when he wrote this uh, message. And he saw himself as someone who protected the congregation from false teaching. But he also was someone who loved them dearly. And in the New Testament, there are about 96 images of the church. You know some readily. The bride, the body, a field of grain, a, a, a city on a hill, a temple, salt and one very important one is family in 1st Timothy 2 15 the church is described as God's household in John 1st John 1 sorry 1st John 3 16 we are called brothers and sisters and we are encouraged to be a family and express love as a family and it's not just John who's encouraging the church as a family to love each other. Listen to Paul. Build yourselves up in love. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. And in Galatians he said, serve one another through love. In First Peter, Peter says, Show sincere brotherly and sisterly love for each other. From a pure heart, love one another constantly. And Hebrews chapter 11 says, chapter 10 says, Let us watch out for one another, to stir one another to love and good works. Love is as essential to the church family 
as a roof is to this building. We've been on the lookout for a pastor for quite a time here in this church. And we want someone just like John. Someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone who loves God's word and truth. And someone who loves God's people. You will notice in verses 1 to 7 of this reading, the emphasis is upon truth, especially truth about the person of Jesus. False teachers have been getting into the church like white ants and trying to bring it down. In the 21st century, 99% of people who know about Jesus will say that he was an actual human being who lived in Israel between 1 and 33 AD. But then, less than 50% believed that he was also God in the flesh, that in him the Godhead dwelt bodily, that he was truly God and truly human in the one person. In the first century, it was the other way round. 90% believed that a God could come to this earth. But only a minority believed that he came as a human being in Jesus. That he was fully God and fully human at the same time. And so that's why John says in verse 2, Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That was the, that was the test. Do you believe that God came to this earth in the person of Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is truly Lord of all, that he was fully human, fully God. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus is very central to the life of church. We come here to worship him, to thank him, to trust him, to honour his greatness. We come here to learn how we can adjust our lives to his teaching. And we come here to encourage one another to follow him and to trust him through the week. Some churches so emphasize truth, they neglect love. Others so emphasize love that they neglect truth. But John has the right mix. It's 100% truth and 100% love. That's how they go together. But in verses 7 to 11, the emphasis is upon love. Love is from God. God is love. God loved us before we loved him. And the clearest and brightest way that God's love was revealed to us is that he sent his son into the world to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now, the word atoning sacrifice, again, is not the right translation. It's propitiation, because that's a big word. It's hard to get your tongue around. They put atoning sacrifice. But the word is propitiation. Uh, the Greek word is hilasmos, which is much easier to say. But it's a very important word in the New Testament. It's found in 1 John 2 verse 2 where it says, Jesus himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. You read it again in Romans 3 and in Hebrews 2 verse 17. And to propitiate means to offer a sacrifice or gift to placate the anger of a God. And our God is a holy God. 
and he expresses his wrath against sin because he sees its ugliness, its darkness and destruction. And that wrath needs to be taken away. It needs to be propitiated. Now let me give you a down-to-earth example of what propitiation means. I drive my car into church down the ramp and my foot slips and instead of the brake it goes on the accelerator and bumps into Peter Tarbuck's car. It sends Peter's car over the bank down into the gully where it rolls and then when it stops it bursts into flame. Peter's already in the church he comes out and he looks at his car and he has a righteous anger. He has a righteous anger. And he sees me. And I say to him, it'll be okay, Pete. Your insurance will pay for it. And he says to me, but I've got no insurance. He says, it'll have to be your insurance. I say, Pete... I'm sorry, I missed out paying my insurance last week. I'm not insured. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and he is very angry, and rightly so. He's been wronged. So I go home. I sell what remains of my car. I take all the money out of my savings account. I talk to the bank manager and get a very generous loan and I buy a black Mercedes sports car. <laughs> and I take it and I deliver it to Peter. And at once his anger is taken away. Justice has been done. Relationship has been restored. The black Mercedes is the propitiation, is the propitiation. Now in heaven, in eternity, the Father and the Son are speaking. And they agree that the sins of human beings require righteous punishment if justice is to be done and the son says to the father I will go to earth and take the side of humanity and represent them before you I will live a life of full obedience and love towards you I will take all the righteous anger rightly directed against sin upon myself. <coughs> Let your wrath fall on me. I will be the propitiation for the sins of the world. Justice will be done. Forgiveness can be offered. Fellowship can be restored. And that's how Jesus Christ shows his love for us. He is the propitiation for our sins that takes away the anger of a righteous God. And he did this while we were all sinners, while we were at our very worst, while we were enemies, when there was no love in us, God commends his love towards us in that Christ died for us. And then Jesus showed his love by spending himself for our sakes. Now I know parents who have spent themselves for their children. They've sacrificed. They've worked hard. They've done everything possible to provide 
the very best. I know pastors who have spent themselves on behalf of their congregation, who worked 90 hours instead of 40 hours. I know missionaries who have literally burnt themselves out spending themselves to spread the gospel. Jesus spent himself. He gave up his ease. He gave up his comfort. He gave up his honor. He gave up his wealth in heaven and became poor despised. He had nowhere to lay his head and all for us. He denied himself. He underwent great suffering. He shed his blood so that we could be forgiven, <coughs> accepted and saved. And he did this without the expectation of this love being returned in the same manner. Now I know parents who have given everything for their children. But the children don't acknowledge it. They're not thankful for it. In fact, the more that the parents give, the more the child rebels. And the love that's been invested in the children has been trampled upon. And it causes deep hurt and heartbreak. But the parents keep on loving. And Jesus knew something of that when he spent himself for us. He knew that we are poor and miserable, empty-handed outcasts who might receive from him but couldn't give back in return. He knows that we have no money or price with which to purchase anything <coughs> and that he must freely forgive us. For he must freely give us all that we need. And that's what he has done. He has given everything for us. And he gives us all that we need in love. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us righteousness. He gives us a new heart. He gives us eternal life. He gives us his spirit. He gives us his love. He, he gives us that love to go into our hearts so that we can love him. And John, in this passage, says, God has loved us in this way. And we also must love one another. To love one another freely, generously, sacrificially, selflessly and constantly. What a challenge. This is the greatest challenge that any church faces. And all we can do is to let the love of God and the Lord Jesus Christ fill our hearts so it can overflow to others. These words that John wrote are powerful and true and living. Do we believe them? Imagine a young man, he's on a fishing trip and uh, he wants to tell his girlfriend that he loves her. So he goes to Interflora and orders the best, the brightest, the freshest bunch of flowers and the most expensive bunch of flowers he can purchase. And he gives order to Interflora that they are to be placed at the front door of his girlfriend at 
10 minutes to 6 in the morning. Early in the morning, she goes to the front door and she sees this beautiful bunch of flowers. The smell is heavenly. They look so bright and fresh in the morning sun. Now, she could leave them there at the doorstep to wilt and die, or she could take them into the home, put them in vases, and brighten the place, freshen up the house, and remember her boyfriend. Now, the flowers are like God's love. God's great, abounding, wonderful love is at the door of our hearts. Will we open the door and let that love pour in or will we shut the door? Fling your heart's door open and receive the love of God in all its, all its warmth, its sincerity, its healing power and pass on that love to others. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your love is so great, we can never measure it. The height, the length, the depth, and the breadth. But Lord, pour your love into our hearts so that we may love one another as the scripture tells us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.